Again, thank you and remind you uh, we are in our season of prayer and fasting 40 days leading up to Resurrection Sunday, praying for a harvest, praying for souls. That's, that's what we pray and fast for. All over the globe, there'll be people in church on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, that won't be there any other time. It's the busiest day for the church all over the world. We're praying that God will touch lives, save souls. Prodigal sons and daughters will come home and return. We're praying for souls. That's what we're praying for. And as we pray, as the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. We, we are expecting God to answer prayers, not just for the lost, but I think God is glorified in honoring the desires of our heart. And I want to share with you some of these testimonies. And don't forget, if you've got one, share it with me, get it to me. Uh, but again, I want to emphasize we are praying for souls. How many of you know somebody that needs Jesus? All of us. I'm praying whether it's this church, it's not, it's not about them coming to this church, necessarily, wherever they are, whatever part of the world they're in. I want them to be saved. I want them to be in heaven. Amen. Here's some of the testimonies that have come in this week. This is uh, one that was emailed to me. It says, Dear Pastor Mark, I visited your church twice in the past year, both times. I felt welcomed and honestly at home. Since November of last year, I've been watching the 1030 service online, and it's been weighing on me to send this email. Growing up, uh, I was always forced to go to church and didn't want anything to do with it. But listening to you talk about God and the relationship that you have with him, I've started praying again and reading my Bible daily. I'm getting emotional just writing this. Even my husband has started praying and watching the service with me. We feel closer in our marriage since we started the praying together. Thank you for bringing us back to God and showing us that living godly is so much better than living in the world. Amen. Here's one that was uh, sent to me. This was a, a financial blessing, huge financial blessing. A debt of $89,303.82 was forgiven for 21 years of public service. To God be the glory, almost $90,000 worth of debt. Uh, and, and they didn't just send me the info, sent me a screenshot of the paperwork to back it up. So God is good. Amen. Hey, if that was $90,000 for you, you'd clap a whole lot happier than that. Amen? <laughs> Give the Lord praise all over the house. Here's uh, another email one that says, uh, Good morning, Pastor Mark. Another praise report. My stepdad was diagnosed with colon cancer and sarcoma this past January. Both the polyp and the lesion were removed. The place where the sarcoma is located is inoperable for him, and he is... Uh, 78 years old and uh, health-wise not a candidate for the surgery. Uh, since I put him on the pink slip prayer list, he's gained five pounds. And as the doctor said, he will be able to be a candidate for radiation, which will extend his life expectancy by at least 10 years. My family is so thankful to God and thank you all for your prayers. Amen. Give the Lord praise. There's a couple more that's coming this week. One that... Uh, uh, was blessed with a new job, with the uh, ability to be able to work from home, which was a huge answer to prayer. And they said their starting pay was $8 an hour more than what they were expecting. So how awesome is God? Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, another one that uh, was accepted into a uh, law school program, which is uh, pretty prestigious in and of itself, got notification that it had been accepted and was also uh, granted a $15,000 scholarship, I think per year, uh, that wasn't even known about or even applied about. They just got the memo, said, hey, I want to congratulate you. You've been accepted into the program, and by the way, we're giving you $15,000 worth of scholarship. To God be the glory. How awesome is that? And one last one for this week. Uh, one individual got a $6,000, over $6,000 per year pay raise, and a large bonus to God be the glory. Amen. Let's give God praise one more time. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2. 
As we turn there, last week we talked about Elijah rebuilding and repairing the altar of God. Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord, restored prayer back to the nation, if you will. And Elijah prayed, and he expected that God would answer, and God did answer. I, I'm, I'm saying that because I feel the Holy Spirit nudging me to remind you, if we will get back to tending the altar of the Lord, we can come in, in prayer to God, and we should come expecting all throughout the pages of Scripture, we, we see that the, the expectation, you know, some say the expectation is the breeding ground for miracles, and it's, it's a biblical thought. All throughout the pages of Scripture, you can see that expectation preceded the answer to prayer. Uh, anytime you see Jesus declare to someone, your faith has made you whole, or, or be it done according to your faith, your expectation, you, you came, you, you brought it to the Lord, and you expected that God who could answer would answer, and God did. Elijah tended to the altar of God. Elijah prayed, and Elijah expected, and God did answer. Acts chapter 2 is what I want to preach on this morning. I've preached this before, but can't get it off my, my heart. Acts 2, verse... 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourself from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Skip down to verse 47 in that chapter. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now I'll flip over to chapter 3, Acts 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. Notice that at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate. Look at your neighbor and say, at the gate. A certain man, lame, mother, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple or to beg. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked alms of them. Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something to them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Leave your Bibles open for just a minute. I want to stop here. Peter lifted him, and God healed him. Peter lifted him up, and God healed him. Peter was expecting, and God showed up. Peter was just doing what he had, had done to him. How many of you in here, God's ever done something for you? If God has saved you, you, you ought to be able to lift someone else up and watch God do what only God can do in their life. Lift someone else up in prayer and believe. As we pray for souls, that's what I'm asking, is that you'll lift up your loved ones and that you'll expect that God will heal their soul, that God will do what only he can do. If we lift them up by faith, I believe that God will meet us there in the middle. Peter lifted him up and God healed him. Peter was doing what he had seen God do in his own life. You remember the story how Peter walked on water. When Peter began to sink, it was Jesus that reached down and saved Peter. Peter knew it wasn't in his hand to lift the man up, but he knew that God would. And Peter was just showing, look, buddy, I know, I know what God can do. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have freely I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And verse 8, and he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Let me tell you, brother, sister, I love this story. I, I love it because here's this man sitting outside the church and just expecting a little bit of change. And God shows up that day. 
and changes his life, all right? It wasn't just changing his cup. It was changing his heart, changing his legs, changing his whole future. God showed up that day. I love this, and, and, and what I love the most is to see this man jump up and leap and follow them into the temple of God, jumping and shouting. I don't know what kind of church it was, but it was Pentecostal that day. Listen, you got a reason to shout. You got a reason to praise. It would behoove us never to forget what God's done for us. I love how this man, listen, he, he, he was hoping for a little change in the cup. He got so much more than that. He did not wait for an invitation to follow them in. He jumped up, ran in. He was jumping up and down, shouting, praising God for what he had done in his life. Some of us need not ever forget what God has done in our life so that we would always be faithful to enter the house of God, giving God our highest praise, rejoicing, and testifying to everybody around us. Look what the Lord has done. Oh, somebody give him praise all over the house this morning. We're praying for souls, and I want to tell you this morning, the heartbeat of the message today is that God has placed people right in front of you who desperately need Jesus. God has placed them within arm's reach of you. There's so many people laid right at the gate in front of us. I wanted to read for you a little bit from chapter 2, although that's not what I'm preaching. I'm preaching on Acts 3, but I wanted to read for you. In Acts chapter 2, we, we, we see a multitude of people gathered together rejoicing, shouting, praising God. But when we turn to Acts chapter 3, the excitement's died down. The, the, the crowd has dwindled, dwindled away. There's now two men walking into the temple. I'm not saying there wasn't a crowd in the temple, but we don't see a crowd that's gathered around this man who has need of the Lord. Thousands of converts in chapter 2. And then when we get to chapter 3, where is everybody at? And I've said this before, and I, and I believe it applies to any given sermon, but I want to know who's serving God when the sermon is over. Who will still be serving God when we leave church today? So let me, let me break it down for you. It, it, it amazes me that sometimes the altars will be filled on a Sunday morning. With the power and the glory of God touching people's lives and they can feel the tug of the Holy Spirit weighing on them. And we feel that glorious power of the Lord all around us and then come back Wednesday and half of those people aren't even here. Who'll still be serving him when the sermon's over? Who'll still be serving him on Wednesday when this sermon's over? Who'll still be serving him on Monday when the sermon's over? How many times have we come and we felt that same touch and we felt that glory of God? We felt the Holy Spirit draw us out and some of us, we go back to work tomorrow as though nothing ever happened. Who'll still be serving him when the sermon's over this morning? See, it's great that we get a touch on a Sunday. It's great and wonderful that the power and the glory of God will touch and impact our life. But if we leave here and we do nothing with what we've already received, what good is it? James tells us to be doers of the word. Peter and John showed up, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have freely I give. Who will still be serving him when the sermon's over? In Acts chapter 2, when that sermon was over, I don't see the multitude still gathered around rejoicing. Yeah, they might have been having church, but I praise the Lord that there was at least still two men that were high on the Holy Spirit that walked past this man and saw beyond the cup that he was shaking and saw that there was a God in heaven who could meet a need that no man had been able to meet. He's been there. The Bible tells us in chapter 4 he's more than 40 years old. Lame from his mother's womb, we can presume this has been a lifestyle for him sitting at the gate, watching the people of God pass by on their way to church, on their way to the temple. And, and let me say this because I don't want some of you that, that are scholars to, to, to call me out on it. I understand in, in, in the day and time that they were in, this lame man would have been forbidden to enter into the temple because of his condition. But the Bible tells me that at the hour of prayer, Peter and John walking by at the hour of prayer. I love this. Amen. 
They had been praying. <laughs> you and I, I'm asking you to be in prayer. In the season of prayer. And at the ninth hour, at the appointed time, I love this. At the ninth hour, they show up. There's a divine appointment for this man. Peter and John have been in prayer. The power of the Holy Spirit had fallen in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. We, we see that 3,000 souls converted. Talk about being prayed up. Talking about being on fire. Still serving God when the sermon's over. Peter and John come by at the appointed time filled with prayer. At the ninth hour. Here's what I love about the ninth hour. Your Bible teaches this. When Jesus died on the cross. See, Old Testament law said this man was not well. He could not enter into worship with them. But how many of you know that Jesus died for whosoever? The Bible says as Jesus hung on that cross. You can go and read this in the gospel accounts of the crucifixion of Christ. From the sixth hour till about the ninth hour, the sun was covered in darkness. And at the ninth hour, glory to God, at the ninth hour, the Bible says that Jesus gave up the ghost. Do you know what happened when he gave up the ghost? When he declared it is finished, the rocks in Jerusalem began to shake and split in two. And the temple veil was ripped from the top all the way down to the bottom, exposing the holy of holies, giving access to whosoever, to the glory and the presence of God, that they could enter into the presence of God. So this man might have been sitting on the outside for some season and the Old Testament may have declared he's not good enough but Peter and John come along at the ninth hour at the appointed time to remind them God's already made a way, brother. There's no reason for you to be outside the glory of God any longer. There's so many people that God has sat outside the gate of you, your life. Let me, let me read this for you. I wonder how many times we, we pass people by. There were so many people, so many people coming into the temple, so many people on their way to church. How many people, multitudes and multitudes, pass this man by? Maybe even put a little tip in the cup. How many people do we pass by every Sunday on our way into the church that we don't have time for, that we could have called and invited to church, that we could have went out of our way and picked up? How many that we could have called, you know, the ones that's been saying, yeah, I'll go with you sometime. Just remind me. And you could have called them this morning and woke them up. Well, it shouldn't be my place to wake them up. I understand it's inconvenient. I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful for the people that loved me enough to tell me about Jesus. I'm so thankful for the people that loved me enough to be inconvenienced to preach the gospel. I'm so thankful for the people that love me enough to tell me that there's a God in heaven that can save your soul, Mark Crumpton. Some of you had grandmas that prayed for you. I didn't have that. You ought to be thankful for a praying grandma that would look you in the eyes and tell you, baby, you need to get right. You can't keep living like that and please God. You ought to praise God for a praying mama, a praying daddy, somebody that will love you enough and tell you that you don't have to live like this any longer. There's a God in them silver and gold. Have I none? Such as I have freely I give. There's so many people that we pass who are on the outside. Let me just be honest with you. Friend, there's work to do on any given Sunday morning on our way to church. There's work to be done. There's souls that need Jesus. And there are many of them that he's laid right outside the gate. And sometimes we're in too big of a rush, too busy to stop and invite them. We don't want to be bothered. We don't want to be inconvenienced. In Luke chapter 16, you can see this on the screen. I'm not preaching this text, but I want to pull something out of it. There was a certain beggar, verse 20, 16 and 20. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate. Look at your neighbor and say his gate. Talking about the rich man's gate. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Now you and I who are rich in the Lord. You and I who have been the recipients of such profound and wonderful divine grace. You and I who have received salvation. Rich in the bread of life ought to be faithful to share with those who are laid outside of our gate. 
don't you understand the Bible says that you are the temple of God. This man that we see, he's laid right outside the gate of the temple. Know ye not that your body's the temple? There are people that God has placed within arm's reach of your home. Let me say it this way. There are people whose name is in your cell phone. And your name is in their phone. And there are people that if you were to call them today and they saw your name on their caller ID, they would take that call. And yet some of those people are as lost as lost can be. Some of us, we've got children that we love that aren't saved. I'm going to meddle here for just a moment because I've preached too many funerals. and I've listened to parents plenty of times. Well, you know, I've told my kids I need to be in church, you know, but I don't want to push them away. I've preached too many funerals already where I've watched mothers and fathers weeping and mourning and crying. Because when they had the opportunity to plead with their children to be in the house of God, they were too afraid that they might offend them and they didn't say anything. You take it for what it's worth. Seize the day while there's daylight. None of us are promised tomorrow. Co-workers, family members, neighbors, they're they're people that that God has placed within arm's reach of your life, an arm's reach of your heart. And for the mom or the dad that's afraid of offending their children, whether they're grown or kids, let me tell you, you ask anyone who had a, a praying mother or a grandmother, they may have felt convicted when grandma would say, baby, you, you know you need to start living for, for God. You need to start living right. Not one of them was ever offended. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things that we respect the most about those people in our life, that they were consistent, even if we didn't heed the warning. There are people in our life today that's just outside the gate that you believe in your heart of hearts this morning that if they were to die today, they would not be in heaven. So I want to know, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? You're smart enough to know that this isn't a game. We're not in church because it's some religious game. There's a real heaven and a real hell. There's there's an eternity to be spent, an eternity to be spent. It's appointed unto man once to die, and we all know that. Everyone knows that death is an appointment for all of us, whether you're a newborn baby or whether you're 98 years old. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And I'm not trying to scare you. Listen, I'm saved. It doesn't scare me. Death is coming for me. I know it is. And I tell you with a smile on my face, not in mockery, but in excitement. When the Lord calls me home, listen, I'm ready. There's an old song, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. He calls my name, I'm ready. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to remind you the reality is. This is not a little thing. If there are people in your life today that you love and God's placed them within arm's reach of you, he's placed them and laid them at the gate of your life, do something with it. How many people had passed this man by? Verse 2 says, A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried. Whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. This had become a lifestyle. 
Daily they carried him there. What a tragic thing I, I think about when I read about this story, how tragic it was. He's more than 40 years old. I assume that probably for 40 years or longer, this has been his daily routine. Take me to the temple. I'll sit outside the church. I'll shake my little cup. The tragedy is not the condition of this man's body. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? All of these testimonies are powerful. But what does it profit someone to get a financial blessing or to have all the riches in the world and die and go to a devil's hell? What does it profit? I, I love to hear the testimonies of people being healed physically in their body. And God does this every year. But what does it profit a man if God should heal his physical body here and he would die and go to a devil's hell because he's not saved? The tragedy as I read this story is not the condition of the man. It's the condition of his soul. The tragedy is where he's at. He's right here at the temple. And every day people come in and they walk right by him. And maybe they throw a little money in his cup. He's so close, but he's so far away. He's so close to the word of God, but he can't hear it. And I can't help but begin to think, you know, in, in that scenario, you know, the people that carried him there every day, surely they could have carried him just a little further and sat him on the front row. Surely there are people that, if we wanted to, we could have went and picked up this morning and they'd be in church with you today. I don't believe that there's one person here who's old enough to drive and even most of them who aren't. That if we truly love the people we say we love like we say we love them, wouldn't be willing to be inconvenienced to bring them a little further. Hey, if you need a wake-up call, I'll wake you up. Man, I'm up anyway. I may as well call you, wake you up. Coming to church this morning, you up? Ah, well, well, I am now. Good, praise the Lord, just in time. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll swing by and pick you up, but it's not on your way. It's fine. Now that we're both up early. I applaud moms and dads on Mother's Day and Father's Day and your birthdays when you say, this is, this is what I want for Mother's Day. I want you to be in church with me. This is what I want for my birthday. I'll lift you up. I've been lifting you up in prayer. And I'm believing that God's going to do what only God can do as I lift you up into Him. I assume it's the same for all of us, but it didn't take but one sermon to change my life. Now, I ignored a whole bunch of them. I can't even say I ignored. There's plenty of times, man, my, my fingers was hurting. Had a death grip on the chair in front of me. Some of y'all, when y'all finally get saved, now I want y'all to put a little extra in the offering plate because y'all done damaged a few of our chairs sitting back there for years <laughs> holding on. How many people have walked walk by this man for 40 or so years? And I can't help but think, you know, maybe, maybe after a while you, you begin to think to yourself, I must be all right. Nobody's invited me any further. I'm close enough to God. I'm a good enough person. If, if that weren't so, then surely somebody, somebody who's walked past me all these many times who loves God, surely one of them would have told me that I don't have to live like this. But the fact that they haven't, has led me to believe that maybe I'm good enough. There's a lot of religious folks today, and they believe they're good enough, and some of them are laid right outside the temple of our life, and we know the word, but they assume, because you've never said anything to them, that if that were true, that they weren't good enough in and of themselves, that you would have told them. Well, you know, I'm not to judge anybody. I'm not asking you to judge anybody. 
Well, Pastor, I don't know my Bible that well. You don't have to. You, you, don't, you don't have to know the Bible from one cover to the other. You don't have to be some theologian. You don't have to be some Bible college graduate. You, you can be like the song says, hey, I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Let me tell you what God's done in my life. Let me tell you what God's done for me. This is, this is what Peter's doing. The Bible says, Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. Peter, Peter walks by this man, shakes his cup. Hey, you got a little change. And Peter looks at him, looks at him in the eyes. He says, look at me. Who's this man that's saying that? That's Peter. P Peter was the backslider. Peter was the one that denied Jesus three times. Peter was the one that went back to fishing and forsake that. P Peter, Peter knows what it's like to feel isolated. Peter knows what it's like to be on the outside. When Peter looks at him, what Peter's saying is, Brother, I know what it's like to be on the outside. Look at me, silver and gold have I none. The things that men have put into your life have not made you any better. But that which I have, I give freely. I didn't come to put a little tip in your bucket any day. I, I've come today to tell you that there's a God in heaven that can heal your soul, that can heal your body. There's a God in heaven that can transform your life. Look at me. Look at what he's done in my life. If God's ever done anything in your life, you ought to be able to look at somebody else and say, I may not know the Bible that well, but here's what I know. God saved my soul. He saved my family. Let me tell you something, brother. Says you, you are responsible for the way that you live. You are responsible to live your life in such a way that it glorifies God. You are the light of the world. Our scripture for the year, you are you. You are the light of the world. You are responsible for how you live your life. You are responsible to live your life in such a way that it glorifies God and it points others to the hope of Jesus Christ. See, I worry that many of us, we, we don't invite people. We don't, we don't reach out to those that we walk past, those laid outside our gate, because we cannot ask them to look at us. Paul would say it this way, follow me as I follow Christ. But some of us, we know, if I start talking to my neighbor about coming to church with me, he's going to think, wow, you go to church. I can go about eight houses down and I can invite that neighbor, Pastor. How about him? But the one that lives next door to me, you know, he kind of sees what goes on in the backyard. I wonder what our children see when they look at us. And we can't figure out sometimes why our children grow up and then they don't want anything to do with the God that... There was more behind that email that I read of that young woman that talked about how God has changed her heart just through coming and listening to the sermons and what God's doing in her marriage. You know, sometimes we, we look and, and we see an example that's set before us that does not point us to Jesus Christ. Your children look at you, Mom. Do they see a woman of God who honors God, who honors her husband, who, who stays faithful to the Word? Who's faithful to the things of God? Who's faithful to be in worship? Dad, when they look at you, when they look up to you from a very young age, do they see a man of God that they can follow? A man that will cover them in prayer. A man that will lead his family. A man that will honor God and honor his wife. When your co-workers, when they look at you, can, can they see God in your life? Again, you don't have to be perfect. Peter wasn't perfect. And this is part of what I love about that, that God used Peter. That's one of the beautiful things I think about Scripture is that all of our mighty heroes in the Bible, the, the heroes that we read about, God could have made sure that he covered up and hid all of their faults and flaws so that we wouldn't see them and think negatively. But instead, it's almost like God highlighted that part. Uh, 
And that's really what Paul would go on to say. Paul said, I was the chief of all sinners, but for this reason, God saved me and called me to the work so that I would be an inspiration and a hope to others that if God could do it for me, he could do it for you. You don't have to be perfect. But you should be consistent. Follow me as I follow Christ. Look, I might trip and I might stumble and I might fall. But I'm going to get up and I'm going to keep marching forward. It'd be a shame that, and this is maybe why some of you can't invite somebody to church because God forbid they'd show up and you didn't. Hey, that's happened more than a few times. Mm Mm-hmm. I'll say this one more time. And I'm gonna, you are responsible. That word responsible has some implications behind it. It, it, it implies accountability at some point. You are responsible for how you live your life. You are responsible and accountable to God. We who are rich in Christ, God has laid people outside the gate of the temple, outside of your life, that are desperate and hungry, just looking for crumbs, looking for a little bit of hope. The Bible says in verse 5, and this man gave heed unto them expecting to receive something. Have you come expecting? This man looked unto them expecting to receive something. And not only was he expecting, but we can see that Peter was expecting also. That's why Peter would say what he said and do what he did. Let me tell you something, brother, sister. If you live your life in such a way that you point others to Jesus Christ, I promise you, people will look up to you. And there'll come a day where they're expecting to find hope in you. You may not have seen it yet, but you will. You keep serving God, you will. You might have people in your family that say, I don't want nothing to do with God. You wait till a storm comes. You wait till a trial comes. You wait till the doctor can't help them. And they'll show up at your door looking at you, hoping, expecting to find help, expecting to find comfort, expecting to find scripture, expecting to find prayer. This man locked eyes with Peter. Expecting. Peter also was expecting silver and gold have I none for in all your life people have poured religion into you people have filled your cup with their little bit of money filled your cup with their little scripture and verse for the day there's a lot of people this is the sad commentary there's a lot of people that are just like this man in church. He's at the church, but he's not in the church. He's at the gate, but he's not in the church. Listen, let me tell you something. The church isn't the building. I hope you know that. The church is the body of Christ. There are plenty of people that are at the church. They're they're in the building, but they're not in the body. Sir, you you've you've had your life filled constantly. With the things that man can offer. You, you, you've sought after what will meet your needs. What will make you feel good in the moment. What will help you out today. And I don't know if Peter actually literally didn't have anything. Or if what he was saying is silver and gold I have I none. What I have is better than what you're asking for. What I have today is not silver and gold. What I have is Jesus Christ. That same God that filled my life can fill your life. The same God that loved me when I was unlovable. The same God that loved me when everybody else said I was an outsider. I want to tell you friend that God can save you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand and walk. Stand with me all over the house this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have freely I give. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand and walk. And the Bible says at that point, Peter 
stretched forth his hand, took him by the hand, and Peter lifted him up. And God healed him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, here's what I want to ask you to do. I'm asking you to lift those people up in prayer that you love, that God has laid outside the gate of the temple. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to picture in your mind this morning who are the faces of the people that God's laid outside the gate of your life? Who are the people in your life this morning that they need Jesus? And God's put you within arm's reach of them. As God places those faces in the forefront of your mind, I want to open these altars and I want to ask you to come. Would you come and lift them up to the Lord this morning? Would you come and bring those names to the altar of God this morning? Will you come and lift them up in prayer? All over the house, come. And as you come, ask God, Holy Spirit, will you give me the courage? Give me the words to speak and the opportunities to speak them to the people I love. I want them to be in heaven with me. I want my children there. I want my spouse there. I want my mother and my father. I want my neighbors and my friends. The people that I work with, Lord, I want to see them in heaven. All over this house, would you find you a spot and pray? Let's lift these up into the Lord. Not only today, I want to know who'll still be worshiping when the sermon's over. Who'll be a doer of the word as you lift them up to God? Lift them up with expectation that God, you'll do what only you can do. But I'll be faithful to do what you've called me to do, to be a light, to be a witness, to be faithful. All over this house, let's gather in prayer and worship. You are